So what we're working on here is a programmatic perspective uh, for program development uh, that promotes sustainability uh, within a technical writing program. So this is a critically, critically reflexive focus uh, on the relationships uh, that happen within the program. So the main relationships that we focus on are things like from relationships between courses, between courses and the overall program, uh, et cetera. So this view of the programmatic perspective uh, moves us past assessment only thinking uh, to promote programmatic sustainability. Uh, it's a bi-directional and recursive dynamic between programmatic elements uh, and stakeholders. This is built on the idea of deep sustainability uh, from Johnson, who points out that sustainability requires attention to reflection and to action. Uh, so we're engaging in multi-directional active reflection and facilitating the maintenance and growth of our program. Uh, deep sustainability then is looking beyond the surface to push back against more shallow reflection and look deeply into really what's going on between those connections that I talked about previously in the last slide. So we move them from sustainability to accountability, uh, looking at the fact that TPC programs are both locally situated um, and, shaped, and shaped by field-wide trends. Uh, so we're looking at the interconnected processes in which TPC uh, administrators and faculty regularly engage, uh, trying to give those processes a critical and recursive review uh, to build better programs all the way around and from the ground up. To do that, um, what uh, Trevor Malone will advocate is the use of the GRAM model. The GRAM model is a continuous improvement model pulled from industry, and it looks like this. And this is the TPCCA right here in the middle, that happy person. And you engage in this recursive process um, where you gather information and then engage with it, read it, and then analyze it, and then do stuff with it, and then begin the whole process again. And doing that allows you to focus on the relationships between elements within the program rather than seeing each individual element as discrete. It facilitates reflection and data collection across institutions. It meets institutional requirements while being grounded in that programmatic perspective, that connection between um, elements in the program. And it allows you to assemble, analyze, and align processes and knowledge work in this iterative framework. And the value of the iterative framework is that it allows you to constantly renew those relationships in a sustainable way. So RAM has a lot of benefits. Um, it functions as a heuristic. It's a way to think through how to handle your program administration in a sustainable, deeply sustainable way. It's flexible um, and, uh, and scalable. It allows you to um, scale your programmatic work for very small programs, like even just a single service course, you can still do the RAM model, or a really big program where you have a lot of courses or um, a lot of uh, students, you're serving a lot of students. And it's definitely sustainable because it is recursive. Graham is a process, but what Graham doesn't do is describe actionable ways to make connections between stakeholders. So what we've done is we've developed a programmatic network as a way to put Graham into practice. So this is uh, just a conceptual idea of what the programmatic network might look like in practice. Uh, so again, we're getting beyond just uh, looking at these different nodes of the network for assessment only. This is a structure that allows us to better understand the relationships between the field at large, uh, the individual program, uh, the staff, and the course, and how those multiple goals line up and how that reciprocal relationship feeds into one another. Uh, this diagram, uh, we're trying to demonstrate that it is recursive and dynamic, constantly in motion, uh, that none of these individual nodes of the network are more important than the other, and that they can only support one another. We're going to elaborate individually on uh, the ways that we focus on the program itself in terms of outcomes, administration, and assessment, because you can't escape assessment. Uh, course, uh, we're talking about the continuity, how the goals of the program are realized in the individual classroom through objectives and assignments. Uh, and then we'll talk about the faculty that are actually uh, piloting the ship in the classroom and how we can help uh, in terms of professional development so that the, the faculty can continue to support those course goals, learning outcomes, 
uh, programmatic outcomes. And then finally, Lisa's gonna talk about how we might do this uh, on a larger scale for the field uh, and as a discipline. Are we ready to move on? Yeah. All right, Tanya, up first. All right. Ready to Here knock it are. out. I'm gonna talk about the program level of the network and I'm gonna focus on program outcomes and how program outcomes can be leveraged to increase accountability beyond assessment practices. So, um, accountability in programs is facilitated by this critical review of programs that we've been talking about, the bi-directional recursive dynamic between programmatic elements and specifically stakeholders, and that's a lot of what I'm gonna look at is how you can leverage these other stakeholders that are involved in the network that aren't usually focused on in terms of assessment. So assessment is how programmatic outcomes are generally used. We use them when we have to look at whether or not the program is meeting the goals. We leverage the outcomes. We look at these, these uh, assignments and we make sure that the, out, the, uh, that the program is meeting its goals. However, assessment is forensic. Um, and the use of outcomes is static and top down. You take the established outcomes, which is considered a given, and then you um, use those to look at these already completed assignments um, to make sure that the goals are being met. And both of those processes are disconnected and static. And it flows top down from the program level. My argument is it doesn't have to be that way. And that it can be changed very simply. I'm not inventing the wheel here. This is a very simple process that leverages Graham um, to engage in more dynamic, recursive, and bi-directional use of outcomes and assignments. Okay. So, outcomes made sustainable, and um, this, is, it, this is known that there's a lot of literature in assessment of, that offers advice for analyzing student artifacts, and artifacts is a very forensic word. It's just something that the student has already produced, and my argument is it doesn't have to be that way. Um, assessment literature is less helpful when programs need to identify new goals or proactively change what they emphasize, and that's something we all need to do, and we know we need to do it. We know that outcomes should definitely be adapted on an ongoing basis, and Graham allows us to do that. So, this is my line drawing. Do you like this? <laughs> I like this. This is nice. This is the bi-directional flow. I did that, and what this, what this represents is just that Assignments themselves give us vital information about what we are doing with the program and whether or not we're being, we're being um, productively using those outcomes. And those outcomes are adaptable. We can do that. We can even do it in the assessment process. Part of the assessment process can be looking at the assignments that we're giving people and seeing if they match up with what we want the program to do. It is that simple. And that's part of that recursive process. But wait, there's more. This is my first animated slide. I know that's sad. Thank you, Professor Todd Bennington, but now I know how to animate a slide. So if any of y'all can animate a slide right here, right here, I can do that. I can. So faculty, and this is what uh, Spencer's going to talk about, faculty have a direct line to the impacts of assignments on students. And if you include them in professional development, so from a programmatic level, you, you facilitate professional development, the faculty can give you unique and really powerful insights into whether or not the assignments are promoting the goals and values of the program. But bam! <laughs> I know, right? I know. So, and you can also link that to other stakeholders in the field. If the field refers to um, within the academy and looking at uh, syllabus artifacts and assignment artifacts and seeing what other, um, what other programs are doing and looking at, our, at your own outcomes. And then also doing surveys. And the surveys, they can be very simple. You can just keep track of your alumni and just fire up a survey. And some people will respond, and you'll get insight into what the field outside the academy is doing, which is vital to the work of a TPC administrator. And I think that's that. Look at this. There you go. I kind of want to replay it for you guys. But no, I don't want to touch the third animation. Okay. There All right. So that's that. There we go. That's that. Oh, and this is going to be a classroom example of what I'm talking about conceptually here. Nice. Yeah. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is how we putting in play what we're talking about in a more material sense in the classroom uh, through these curricular expectations is what we're calling them uh, in order to unify the goals of the program in the course. Uh, so the way we're looking at this, um, to get that bi-directional approach that we're talking about, the goals of the program and the course outcomes must be responsive to one another and inform each other. Uh, so we've been working really hard to dig deep and figure out how we unify those goals, which, as we all know, um, can sometimes vastly differ and not be responsive to one another, right? 
Um, so we do this with curricular expectations. And these are things that are kind of similar to program goals, that, but we build them to identify criteria that all courses should incorporate, right? So rather than just goals or outcomes that students in the program should have, uh, there are things that actually need to be in the like syllabi of the courses. Uh, these help us make explicit the things that the program actually values, um, and they connect the faculty and students as stakeholders by giving them a more holistic view of, of what the program is trying to do and how their courses connect to the overall um, view of the program. So one example of when we did this is this uh, new media course that we had at USM. Uh, that last semester as we're changing the goals of the program and setting up new curricular expectations, we wanted to move this from a new media course to a digital rhetoric course specifically, uh, which meant a shift in a lot of things in the course, including the goals, the overall structure, and the assignments. Uh, so we had our curricular expectations over here on the left, and what I needed to do in building the course was build goals that match those, right? Uh, so we should be able to see a lot of uh, similarities in here. So we have, right, make rhetoric explicit is a curricular expectation. So I'm asked the students to make rhetorical decisions in digital spaces. All right, we want to make sure that we have our classes emphasize ethics. Uh, so we need to understand the ethical dimensions of working in digital spaces, for instance, right? And again, these are bi bi-directional, and I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, and that moves into talking about the actual learning outcomes and the assignments and how those relate, right? So from those course goals, you then build learning outcomes, right? What, what do the students actually come away with now that we've built these course goals based on the curricular expectations of what needs to be included in the course? And build assignments that respond to those, right? And this way, you have top down everything's kind of responding to each other in a ladder going up and end, right? So we build learning outcomes like having a basic understanding of the major scholarship in digital rhetoric, uh, synthesizing rhetorical theories and practice, and combining technological skills with rhetorical techniques. And then build these through kind of a scaffolded assignment structure that asks students to uh, talk about their own relationship with technology. Uh, get some production experience with circulation in digital environment, uh, look at what digital media are actually used in the field. And building this actually helped us move kind of from new media as kind of a how to use Twitter class, right, into something that I felt was uh, much more responsive to like what, what are people actually doing once they leave our programs in our classrooms and what digital technologies are they actually using? things like that. Uh, and then asking them to actually build one of those things, right? So I had this digital object thing, which was the best way that I can put it, where I gave them a problem-based scenario and asked them to work in teams to come up with objects that were responsive to that. Uh, so for instance, one of the scenarios was uh, the Tampa Bay Rays were looking to build a new stadium in Edward. Uh, and I asked them to build digital uh, media that would essentially convince various stakeholders around the Tampa Bay area to help fund the project, right? Uh, and they were in teams that had to make their own individual digital things, right? One of the most interesting things, because they're all making their own individual things, is that almost all of the groups, three out of four, uh, decided on their own merit to uh, collect all of their objects together in a website after having all this other stuff built. So like, I didn't need to make that explicit. They realized that these things are related. We should probably put them together on our own. Uh, hold on. So building the course this way, uh, there's a good bit of after the course too, right? So we did a lot of debrief, uh, especially between Lisa and I, and sharing and syllabi between the faculty who are now teaching the course this semester, right? So that we can try to create that continuity that we talked about earlier, right? Of course, doesn't need to be exactly the same or exactly the same as uh, I built it for this iteration, uh, but that's part of the bi-directionality is that we look at what happened, look at the things that work, and revise it going forward. 
And also, if there's anything that was unclear about the curricular expectations that didn't manifest how they should have in the course, we can help revise those too. And this helps us create a feedback loop within the program to revise both courses and cur curricular expectations together, which helps build a more holistic and unified program. Uh, and this, in turn, gives us more sustainable programs. It allows students to see how the course relates to the program as a whole. Uh, unifies individual, unifies courses with the programs they're in, and courses with each other within the program so that they can understand the entire network going on. Uh, so this shows us both how courses fit together and how they fit within the overall uh, program that they're in. And that is a classroom example. Uh, Spencer is going to talk about uh, how we work on professional development to make sure that these kind of conversations and relationships can keep happening and create a healthy program. Thank you, Josh. And I have presents for everyone, but you don't get them yet. Um, so without uh, well-trained faculty like Josh Ray, we wouldn't be able to transform courses that aren't meeting programmatic goals into the kind of class that you just described. Um, and so what I'm talking to you about today is how can we help our faculty, especially our contingent faculty, pursue professional development opportunities that will allow them to sort of view the program and the field throughout this uh, programmatic perspective and then take what they're learning and incorporate it in their own pedagogy. Uh, so, to start, I wanted to think about what are some of the major issues when it comes to encouraging or facilitating professional development in our faculty. Uh, well, professionalization is difficult to facilitate for a number of reasons. Uh, uh, administrators often lack the time, the resources, uh, or even instructor buy-in. Uh, it's, it's difficult to sell to faculty, hey, you should attend this extra workshop, or we need you to spend some more time doing this. Uh, and it's, it's kind of hard to say like, oh, you know, you're an okay teacher, but we need you to be better. <laughs> uh, so it, it's, it's all about uh, how you can package this to be uh, minimal time, minimal resource, uh, or input. Uh, and, and finally, the, the last bit here is that without looking at our programs, from this larger perspective. Uh, instructors, and again, uh, especially contingent faculty, typically just aren't held accountable for continuing to educate themselves or develop professionally uh, and revisit their course structure, class design, et cetera. So uh, the programmatic network uh, can facilitate professional development in a way that adds minimal workload to administrators uh, and it also helps remind administrators, instructors, uh, and everyone involved of their reciprocal relationship uh, beyond assessment, right? How can we learn from one another and help each other improve? Uh, and by looking at it from this programmatic perspective, we can actually help instructors uh, be held accountable uh, to develop sustainable habit practices. That's particularly what I'm gonna talk about next, uh, that will help them uh, develop their pedagogy, and improve the program at large. So now I'm going to be a little cheeky. What method can promise all that? Um, my individual <laughs> research focuses primarily on Eastern rhetorics as they're embodied through martial arts. And so a lot of what I do comes from a martial arts tradition and a background. And what you're seeing here is the uh, Taoist Fakwa, uh, the eight principles of the Tao that lead to balance. Uh, and they've been used, facilitated, appropriated, for better or for worse, in multiple contexts. Uh, but it's something that in my own training uh, helps me realize ways in which I meditate and actively pursue becoming better in whatever it is, whether it be martial arts, teaching, etc. And so I'm thinking a lot about what these eight principles could mean in the workplace, in the classroom, for professional development specifically. And that's that's the bulk of the work that I do. So when we look at these eight principles, uh, when we do kind of a one-for-one -one, uh, translation of what they stand for and the kinds of philosophies that they uh, help you think about, 
we're looking at terms like creativity, enthusiasm, variety, confidence. Um, and these are all what we might lump into the category of inner interpersonal skills that I think are the foundation for uh, any good student, any good continuing educator. Uh, and so my goal is to build in ways that faculty are thinking about these principles themselves. Uh, this is how you cut down on the time resource question for your administrators. You want to embed this kind of philosophy anywhere that you can so that the faculty are constantly iterating their own practices themselves and then receiving feedback perhaps from another source. So uh, just an example, you can take these principles and adapt them to critically reflexive questions. So for instance, creativity. Uh, where can you embed questions like, what new resources could I consult for lesson plan ideas, right? Um, you, can, you can change these up depending on your programmatic goals, what kinds of ways you'd like your faculty to develop. Um, but the simplest way to describe these is to focus on your key points, your key principles, whatever is important to your program, find ways to turn them into those questions the faculty can ask themselves. So we're going to take a look at the next four. Uh, and again, I'm going to give you a handout that sort of explains the ways that we've embedded this in our own practices. Um, particularly this one, I think, is the one with the least one-for-one -one translation, this concept of non-action. Uh, and so the way I describe it to faculty is, where are places that you could relinquish control, uh, in, particularly in the classroom, and what can you learn from that sort of dynamic? Uh, so let's go ahead. Uh, these, uh, what I love about turning these principles into these kinds of guiding questions is you can embed them anywhere. Um, the handout that I'm gonna give you now is something that we incorporated uh, in a spring orientation, so just a, a couple of hours, uh, and we did an activity with faculty that sort of presented these questions to them and encouraged them to incorporate them in things like their own lesson plans, right? Uh, just something that they would see over and over again so that they could keep thinking uh, back and forth about their own pedagogy. But it doesn't have to be that way. You could embed this in shared lesson plans, uh, syllabi, programmatic outcomes, different orientations, workshops, etc. The point is you want something simple uh, and sustainable that faculty can return to without necessarily burning themselves out. Uh, so what you're going to see is the handout that I gave our faculty and some of the, some of the responses that they put to a lot of these questions. Uh, and I encourage you to use this as a template, add to it yourself, uh, and, and take what works and ditch what doesn't. Uh, do I have them? That's it? Yep. Alright, so uh, on a larger scale, Lisa's going to talk to you now about how we can zoom out even further and think about this programmatic perspective. Uh, field-wide. So, Lisa, take it away. So, I kind of look at programs more closely than probably anybody ever considered for the last 10 years. And it was shocking to me when I realized that I had been looking at programs for 10 years. <laughs> but um, what I have learned during that time is that the field, we've oftentimes too focused on our local institutions. And so my whole shtick for the last 10 years is that we have to go outward. But here's the kicker that a lot of people don't 100% realize. Until I took the job at the University of South Florida, I never really ran a program at all. I did pieces of it, like many of us do, but I never had to do the big, huge, full thing. And at South Florida, we have a few challenges that a lot of programs encounter. We teach as many students in our service course as they teach in freshman composition. We have a um, growing undergraduate major and minor that's been unfocused for a long time. We have a massive contingent faculty problem, and as one of the few people in the field who's researched it, I feel pretty comfortable up here saying I myself am, have a massive problem that I don't know how to solve. And so when I came to South Florida, it did a couple of things. It allowed me to sort of take all of this research and put it into practice. Can it actually work? Does the whole idea that I've been thinking of in my head and seeing all these examples, can we bring it and make it work globally and then push it back out globally? 
And part of a way to start to do that is we have to train our graduate students. And so right now, Model Hard School, they did a fabulous job of, um, and it, it shows they've actually listened for the past couple of years. <laughs> um, and so we have to do a better job of teaching our graduate students how to do this sort of programmatic work locally at a broader and deeper and wider emphasis than just thinking of assessment. And then to help them to be able to take those perspectives back into their, their own jobs and lives. And so what you've seen are pieces of how we're trying to do this at the University of South Florida. And the key has been to really focus on the connections between the stakeholders. And so when Joanna Schreiber and I came up with this idea of the continuous improvement model called GRAM, we were frustrated that so much of our scholarship just focused on assessment. It was like, okay, assessment is one tiny ass little piece. How can I get my faculty who aren't necessarily trained to understand what an outcome actually does in the classroom? And so that's how we came up with this idea of curricular expectation. That seemed to be a way to put the educational babble that a lot of faculty just sort of go, oh, outcomes. But it actually put it into a practice that they could start to understand. And so we're using the same terminology. We're using different terminology, but for kind of the same things, depending on the audience that we're talking to. And we're constantly connecting it back to some of the skills and competencies, again, from a lot of the research that I've done and other people in the field have done about what students actually need in the world. Right? To always make it connected back to not just what do they need on the job, I'm very intentional in saying what do they need in the world. They need to be able to do a job, absolutely, we all need money to keep roof over our head, but they also need to engage in the world. And so how can you do all of those things in something as simple as a service course or complicated as an undergraduate? And so that is what our whole kind of shtick is, is to start thinking of our program as part of a larger network that always has to go back to the field and then sort of wind around and that kind of recursive relationship. Which brings us to the hats. <laughs> um, so again, I'm so proud that I have the opportunity to work with grad students such as these at South Florida. And about, um, I hadn't been there very long, and we, there were a weird sort of events that not totally appropriate for here. We came up with an accountability hashtag to help us work through um, all of the tasks that we as faculty have and graduate students, you need to you know, get your work done. And part of that work is learning about programmatic stuff. So one of my big goals from an educational standpoint is that no graduate student should ever leave grad school without an intensely nuanced understanding of how programs work and why and what part they need to play in that when they get another job. How you build a new course, Josh does. How you help manage a program, which is what Tanya does. How you take your research and you put it into play programmatically, which is what Spencer should. And so we came up with this inappropriate hashtag and that led, it had shrimp in the inappropriate hashtag. <laughs> And so then it led to these hats. Now, they should be more paint, but they're not. But these are our kind of hats, and they sort of, for us, uh, are grounding in the work that we need to do, and it's just sort of fun and interesting, and it keeps us all on task. And when we got in to ATTW, because we didn't think we would, we promised each other that if we did it, we would wear our shrimp hats. And so this is what the whole shrimp is about. And for those of you that know me a little bit at all, it really is very indicative of just so many things about me. <laughs> so um, that's our spiel, that's our stick. And we are ready uh, to answer any sort of questions you might have or to tell us that we're crazy or share your own stories, whatever you wanna do. Because that's why we kept it short.